Thanks for that introduction, Sarah. I'm happy to be able to present this webinar entitled An Introduction to ELISA Principles and Troubleshooting. I'll begin with an introduction to the ELISA application and give an overview of the most commonly used ELISA formats. Then we'll go on to discuss important reagents and equipment, as well as considerations when deciding whether to develop your own assay or to purchase a pre-made kit. ELISA stands for Enzyme-Linked Immunosorbent Assay. And common uses of the ELISA assay are to quantitate specific analyte from within complex mixtures and to characterize molecular interactions, such as protein-protein and protein-nucleic acid interactions. There are a number of benefits to using ELISA over other immunoassay formats. A microtiter plate format prevents te permits testing of multiple assay conditions simultaneously, and it allows one to quickly optimize testing conditions. One can easily produce quantitative data with multiple replicates, and due to the small well volume, minimal reagents are required. Also, retaining native protein conformation and optimum reaction conditions throughout the assay permit more physiologically relevant testing conditions. It's important to note that ELISA does not pro provide certain information, such as a target's molecular weight or pattern of distribution within a cell or tissue. Here is just a brief overview of a standard ELISA. On the left, you see a schematic of a traditional 96-well microtiter plate. And on the right, we have magnified one well to demonstrate the general steps of the assay. In step one, we'll bind the target to the microtiter plate well. And in step two, we'll block the well to prevent unintended binding of subsequent assay reagents. In step three, we'll incubate the target-specific antibody. Here we show the antibody conjugated to a reporter enzyme. Step four, add enzyme substrate, and you can see the well turn blue, representing the colorimetric product one would see in the microtiter plate well. Magnitude of color production is subsequently determined by absorbance readings via a spectrophotometer. All ELISA assays make use of the same basic principles. Here we'll compare five commonly used ELISA formats. The first, direct ELISA, which we just discussed, is noted on the left. Moving along, we have the so-called indirect ELISA, because the target-specific antibody does not directly produce signal. Rather, the signal is provided by a secondary antibody bound to that primary antibody. The indirect ELISA is more sensitive than the direct ELISA. This is due to the multiple secondary antibodies, which will bind to each target-specific antibody, amplifying the signal. Sandwich ELISA is so-called because target is sandwiched between a capture antibody bound to the well and the detecting antibodies. The sandwich ELISA assay is considered even more sensitive and specific than an indirect ELISA. The extra degree of specificity is due to the fact that the two different antibodies need to bind to the same target. Sensitivity is enhanced as well, because each capture antibody will bind target molecule, even if the molecule of interest is present is a very small percentage of the total sample. A competitive ELISA is commonly used when quantifying small molecules. In a competitive ELISA, a labeled competitor molecule, which is otherwise identical to the target, is incubated with the detection antibody and sample. As the ratio of sample molecule to labeled competitor increases, the signal is reduced because less competitor is able to bind to the detection antibody. The signal on a competitive ELISA actually decreases as the concentration of the target molecule in your sample increases. Lastly, in the in-cell ELISA is a quantitative immunocytochemistry-based method to measure protein levels or post-translational modifications of cultured adherent cells. For your convenience, I have also compared these ELISA assays based on relative sensitivity, specificity, assay time, and cost to set up. More details on these ELISA assays can be found in the protocol section of our website. Now, a major decision that you'll face after you've decided that an ELISA assay is what you need will be whether to develop the ELISA assay yourself or to go ahead and purchase a pre-made kit from a supplier. So I just wanted to walk you through considerations to help you make your decision. One thing to consider would be the expense. 
if you combine the cost of all the reagents you'll need to buy to purchase to put together your own ELISA, it will likely be substantially more than if you were to buy a single kit from a supplier. However, if you imagine using this assay for an extended amount of time and think this assay will become a staple for your lab, then it's probably worthwhile to develop your own assay because in the long run, you will pay much less than if you were to purchase the equivalent amount of kits from a supplier. Time is another important factor. Time is money, and it is much more efficient to simply purchase a kit from a supplier and receive it the next day. This kit will be guaranteed to work right out of the box, will include a precise protocol, and most, if not all, necessary reagents. Developing your own assay can take weeks or even months to perfect. Frequency of use relates to expense. As I mentioned, if you will use this ELISA assay frequently, definitely consider developing an in-house assay. Then again, if time is critical or if money is plentiful, then you should consider purchasing the off-the-shelf kits. Technical expertise is another important consideration. If you really do not feel confident in your ability to put together an ELISA assay from scratch, then regardless of expense, I would encourage you to search for pre-made kits. And of course, your ability to develop an in-house ELISA assay will absolutely depend on the availability of the necessary reagents. If even one critical reagent is not readily available, then it would probably be necessary to look into purchasing a pre-made kit. Similarly, the option to purchase a pre-made kit will depend on the existence of this kit. If the specific ELISA you are interested in is not yet available as a pre-made kit, then you are limited to developing one in-house. Now let's assume, after these considerations, you decided to develop your own ELISA. In the following section, we will discuss developing your own ELISA in more depth. Four important aspects to keep in mind when developing an ELISA assay are to ensure the assay is specific, sensitive, accurate, and reproducible. This slide shows some of the key materials needed for making your own ELISA assay. In brackets, I've noted equipment that, while not absolutely required, will certainly make running ELISA assays much more efficient. Single and multi-channel pipetters are required, but it is certainly nice to have digital repeat pipetters available for doing any more than one or two plates at a time. You'll need microtiter plates that have a high protein binding capacity. And I definitely recommend sticking to 96 well plates without robotics. It is extremely difficult to work with 384 well plates, for example, without automation. You'll need at least a squirt bottle for washing the plates, although for washing more than a few plates, it is really helpful to have an automated plate washer. Plate washers will also speed your assay and increase reproducibility. Of course, you'll need blocking buffer, protein binding buffer, and enzyme substrate if you're using an enzyme-conjugated secondary antibody. It's important to cover your plates to prevent evaporation during incubations. Plastic wrap can be used, but it may be more convenient to use plastic covers or adhesive plastic seals. Of course, you'll need antibodies that ideally have been tested to function in ELISA. And lastly, you'll need sample and a spectrophotometer to read your data. When binding sample or target to the well, it's important to consider the type of molecule. Typically, large proteins or antibodies are bound to a well, and these types of molecules will adsorb to the polystyrene well and retain their ability to be detected by the antibody. Other types of molecules, such as heavily glycosylated proteins, carbohydrates, short peptides, lipids, and DNA, will need to be modified by the addition of a covalently linked affinity reagent, such as biotin, or a carrier protein before being bound to the well to retain immunogenicity. Of course, antibodies are a key reagent when developing an ELISA assay. One thing to consider is if the antibody has been previously tested to work in an ELISA format. For example, ABCAM will list antibodies as tested via ELISA or S-ELISA or sandwich ELISA. ELISA refers to the use of the antibody as a detection reagent and sandwich ELISA indicates the antibody has been used as a capture antibody in a sandwich ELISA assay. 